IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation. On today's episode of IQ Smart Parent, we are celebrating all things animal. And oh yes, this little guy, he's real. His name is Bob. And he's just one of the animals you'll meet as we explore science, art, and media with a wildlife twist. Hear from an artist whose work celebrates nature and shares important messages about conservation. Meet a 10-year-old boy who turned his love of dogs into a social media sensation and uncover the secrets of the creatures living in your own backyard. That's all coming up on today's IQ Smart Parent, and it starts right now. Welcome to IQ Smart Parent. I'm your host, Darieth Chisholm. Animals bring us everything from joy and awe to education and inspiration. And that's why today's program is all about animals. We're kicking things off with guests from the National Aviary, the nation's premier bird zoo located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so let's welcome Patricia O'Neill and Kathy Schlott, along with artist Lindsay Wright Durko. And we've got a special little guest with us, a penguin <laughs> named Disco. <laughs> welcome, ladies, and Disco. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, so here on IQ Smart Parent, we talk a lot about the maker movement, and we've certainly focused on that in, in previous episodes. But in this case, I want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, maker project that you have at the National Aviary called Wings and Wildlife. Yeah, absolutely, yes. We've had an opportunity over the years to work with local makers and artists who have been inspired by uh, nature and um, the local resources that we have. And um, we, both Wings and Wildlife and the Maker Challenge um, have enabled us to bring in makers who have inspiration surrounding birds and offer products in our gift shop that help us to connect uh, people to birds and to conservation through art um, in a very unique way. Yeah, and Lindsay, you're one of those artists. Yes, I am. Yeah, so tell us about your inspiration for, for painting and drawing birds. Oh, I love all animals, so birds are great, but uh, I've always been interested in all animals. I love to go out into nature and sketch, so I did bring a few of my sketchbooks here, so I love going out finding things to draw. This is something that I've actually drawn at the National Aviary mm -hmm. with the Maker Challenge. I uh, was featuring the rhino hornbill, a bird species there. I love to go find stories and then just kind of put them in my journal, whether that be just visually. So I also have, you know, one of just some penguins. Uh, so just visual, or I like to throw in some words, kind of add a little bit of detail and yeah. education. So for instance, with Disco that we have here, how are you inspired to, to sketch about penguins when you see a penguin like Disco? I think it's great to go and sketch in nature and actually be outside, be there in the experience. Whenever you're drawing something, you're looking at it again and again and again. So it really helps you have that uh, familiarity with your subject and make that uh, experience that's relevant to you and that you'll remember later. So having a live subject is really going to help you have a great learning experience and also have a better drawing. Yeah, well, we also know that Disco is a little artsy himself, right? Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, you have a, a a painting that Disco did. I do, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. This was a painting that was created um, directly by Disco, um, and <laughs> it's part of their uh, wellness program at the National Aviary, uh -huh. um, and we offer these in our gift shop. People can actually take home a painting that was painted directly by one of our penguins. Yes. So. Tell us a little bit about what people learn about science and conservation when they see penguins and they get to experience them. Well, African penguins are a critically endangered species. So I think when people go and they see the penguins, they see how adorable they are, they see them interacting with other penguins, they get curious about them. And then they want to learn more. And that ties directly into the conservation of these species because you want to learn. And then when you find out how amazing these creatures are, you want to be able to go and help them. So you're learning about science, you're learning about habitats, you're learning about ecology, you're learning about how all the animals interact and what their role in the environments are as well as ours. Yeah, so we know you've brought along another 
friend. I and did. so we'll let you do some swapping out. And I'll turn to these ladies and we'll continue <laughs> our conversation. <laughs> you know, it's interesting <laughs> with, with Disco's painting mm -hmm. um, that you feature that. And mm -hmm. I think that's pretty unique. And I'm sure that, you know, when people come and they see this, they think to themselves, wow, look at what these animals, the art that animals can create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that um, you are naturally drawn to what you are um, curious about. And um, so we offer opportunities for people to get up close with um, birds from around the world that they may not see otherwise. Um, and they also get a chance to uh, take home um, something that um, can act as a memory of that experience. And hopefully it inspires them to want to learn more um, and also to help conserve the, the natural resources that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And so do you find that the children are really learning a lot in this process? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, we can provide a real-life context for what they're learning in their classrooms, um, and we also give them a chance to explore what they're curious about. Yeah, well, well I'm pretty curious, and as I'm sure you are, because you can hear our <laughs> owl friend, <laughs> Mike the Owl. Mike the Owl is a Eurasian eagle owl. So they're found in Europe and Asia and can be found down into parts of northern Africa. Eurasian eagle owls are one of the largest owl species in the world. So when you see a beautiful owl like this, what inspires you to sketch and draw and paint? I think it's great to uh, just have that, as I said, that experience, that famili familiarity, that relationship with a live subject whenever you're drawing. It's also really important to uh, take your observation skills that you would use in the scientific process and take that and apply it to drawing. So you're looking at birds, you're uh, looking at nature, you're questioning things, you're observing things, and then you're documenting it visually or sometimes just through notes in a yeah. journal. So yeah, it's very inspiring. <laughs> Those are great tips. What would you advise kids who are interested in doing this? I always tell people, don't worry about what you think the final product's gonna look like. Worry about the experience. Don't go trying to erase or trying to make it look like a perfect drawing. You want it to just have showing what happened so that you remember exactly what happened. So a lot of times I will just draw, you know, if something's wrong, I'll note it. I'll just write a note, that wing's too small, that beak should be longer. And then whenever I'm going back and maybe I'll turn that drawing into a fully rendered illustration, uh, I will look at my notes and make sure that I make those corrections or um, just add a little bit more detail to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what would you en encourage children to do uh, as it relates to really getting creative and um, being in a maker space this way to just allow their own experience with the birds to come alive? Absolutely, I would simply say to get out in a green space um, and take pencils, take paper, um, a blanket, and um, you can go into a park, you can go into a forest or even your own backyard um, and begin to sketch or doodle or write down words that helps you to remember the experience that you have. Yeah, and Kathy, what would you say? Well, there's a whole world with birds out there that people don't even notice. It's just about looking up and being part of the experience and starting to pay attention. But for me, it's also about look how, or just listen to the owls, listen to the things that are happening around you. There's a lot of music going on right around you that might inspire you in other ways. It may inspire you to learn to dance or to be part of, learn an instrument, to sing, to make noises like the animals around you. So there's just so many different components that these birds can inspire you to learn about and to enjoy. And how does this build an appreciation for conservation? If you don't have an emotional connection or any connection, then you're not going to be inspired to want to protect those habitats and protect the species. Mm -hmm. So when you learn and get up close with Mike the Owl or with Disco, it inspires you to do something, to do more, and that is going to help build conservationists. That's going to make us all conservationists, and our children are going to be conservationists because they're going to want to be part of that world. Yeah, definitely. And Lindsay, what would be your final advice to help children just really build that link between science and art and curiosity? Oh, definitely getting out into nature, going out in those green spaces, and not being afraid. Just don't look at that blank page and think, oh my goodness, I have to make a perfect thing. Just draw lines, connect them, just write down words. Anything that you want to do to get your experience out there, don't be afraid to do it. And that's the best advice of all. And thank you ladies so much for being here, and thanks to Mike the Owl. Well, no doubt about it, pet ownership is on the rise. Having kids and pets in the same home may get hectic, but studies show plenty of benefits too. Check this out.
pets offer fun and affection, but experts also found a number of health benefits to having a four-legged friend in the family. One study found that children who grew up with a dog spent more time engaged in outdoor physical activities than children without a dog. But that's not the only health benefit. Early exposure to household pets like cats and dogs can reduce the risk of wheezing and developing eczema. Studies even show petting a cat can help lower blood pressure. And pet ownership also helps to reduce stress and anxiety. Here on IQ Smart Parent, we often talk about smart ways for kids to consume media, but right now we're going to meet a young man who makes media. He is 10-year-old Gideon, and his social media account's called I've Pet That Dog, and he has nearly 150,000 followers. So welcome, Gideon, to the show. Thanks. So excited to have you here. Your mom is joining us as well. Hello. And we're glad that you're here. Mm -hmm. So let's see, you're all over social media. Yes. Yes, all the big social media channels. And we know that a lot of people love petting dogs, but yeah. you decided to do something different with this. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, I just think dogs are amazing creatures, and I think they should have some fame. So tell me about I Pet That Dog. Um, well, I Pet That Dog, well, my website is just pictures of dogs, but my Twitter account, I like ask questions, and then I get the, um, information and build up a story to tell about them. And so I'm, I'm assuming you've got some help and your mom has come yes. along with us, mm -hmm. right? So yes. how, how is it that you mm -hmm. help him with these social media accounts and posting to the website and really generating the interest mm -hmm. that he has? Um, I, I'm not sure I do much to generate the interest, but I help with putting up the posts um, and things like that and monitoring the account. But this was all his idea. He wanted to take a picture with each dog that he met uh, to remember the dog and the experience. Yeah. And then he asked to put up the stories. And how much mm -hmm. work does that take? How much time does it take? We go out about three times a week to find dogs. I do a lot of the background things so he does not have to. The account has kind of exploded and I don't want him to spend hours on it. Yeah. How so. do you guarantee his safety and protect his privacy since mm -hmm. he is so young on social media and having a website? Well, I think, again, I monitor all the notifications. I monitor what he's posting. Uh, he's known around town now. It is definitely become a little more interesting. Um, so we wanted to do something special for you, so we invited a dog yes. for you to meet. <laughs> and um, if you wouldn't mind, you can pop up and say hello, and you can let us know how this process works. <laughs> OK. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Good girl. Hello. Hi. <laughs> What's your dog's name? This is Hi. Bosty. Hi, Bosty. <laughs> It's hard to get a dog yeah. to look the way you want him to. Yeah, she's, okay. she's not exactly there. a TV dog. There we go. All right. There we go. Hey. Bosty. Hey, pup. Gideon, come on in there. Hi. There, there we go. Hi. I'm so glad you had a chance to meet Bosty. Thank you. So come on back over. Let's have a continue mm -hmm. our chat because I'm, I'm pretty fascinated with Hi, Bosty. Yeah, Wait, you turn this right into here. more than just a hobby, which is uh, very interesting. So what are some of the questions do you ask the dog uh, owners? Um, I normally ask, do you have any funny stories about your dog? Um, what's unique about your dog? Um, um, well, in this case, like, um, yeah. does Bosty have a favorite toy? Yeah, so, Shawnee, how about you tell us? Yes, so um, she does. We have this uh, snake that has little squeaky toys in it. And so now, um, unfortunately though, the squeakers are all gone and it's just really, really the shell of orange fabric <laughs> from what used to be a snake. So she, she likes to tear orange. through things. So we have to get really tough toys for her. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so Gideon, I have to know, what are you going to write about Basti and having met him? Well, I'll have to ask um, a few more questions if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. To, um, mm -hmm. Get to know, um, do you have any funny stories about Basti? Oh yes, so um, she's actually, she's really great with obviously kids yeah. and um, cats as well, but there was one particular story where she met a very old 
t uh, turtle named Harold. And Harold was not as like interested in you know the dog experience, so he went in his personalized home studio, <laughs> and Basti um, was just so upset that her friend was gone. And so she took it upon herself to just very gently, ever so gently, just knock on his shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, naturally, Harold was not home for her at that yeah. moment, no solicitors, but um, yeah, I thought that was really a really tender moment that you don't yeah. really see between reptiles and <laughs> mammals, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what else would you need to know? Um, what is Bosti's personality? Well, what would you say? What do you think about her? Happy, unique. Yeah, yeah thank special. you. Well, hi, Bosti. How are you, darling? <laughs> yeah, she's really Hello, friendly and um, very curious about stuff. Um, and she really loves food, so that's why we really get along. Mm -hmm. And what do you hope mm -hmm. that people get out of uh, seeing your posts? I hope they get happiness and realize that dogs are just amazing creatures. Yeah. Well, can you remember, Mom, whenever he first got started with this? And, and, and Hi, you know, what were you thinking when yeah. he said, hey, I want to do this? Um, I was kind of confused. I didn't know what he meant and <laughs> wasn't certain <laughs> if it was something he would stick with. But uh -huh. it's been two and a half years now. So, and he just keeps asking to meet more dogs and we keep going out and finding them. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, it was so fun having you here and really getting to see you in action, Gideon. Thanks so much for being here. And I bet all of you all want to know what is Gideon going to write about Basti and his experience with us. You can find that out at his website and we will have a link from our website. Meantime, research shows pets can help kids learn about patience, compassion, and responsibility. <laughs> but that only happens if parents introduce pet ownership in practical. <laughs> <laughs> Children love pets, but caring for one is a big responsibility. Follow these tips so your furry family member can have a safe and loving experience in your home. Assign age-appropriate tasks when it comes to feeding, playing with, and cleaning up after an animal. Introduce new tasks one at a time so children aren't overwhelmed by their new responsibilities. And make sure your child understands that the pet's well-being depends on these tasks so they can't be ignored. We've all read about exotic animals in nature magazines, but what does it take to research and write those articles? We've gone straight to the source, so let me welcome our final guest today, wildlife writer Jason Biddle, and Mallory Sickle is also joining us from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And Mallory, you also have brought along a few interesting creatures, so we'll get to you in a moment with those guys. But let's start with you, Jason. You've written for several uh, publications. What has, what's really been encouraging you to be a wildlife writer? Well, I think my mom would say I was always that kid that was poking dead things with a stick and looking for crayfish under rocks. And, you know, as I grew up, I, my professional education was in writing, but I always wanted to get back to that sort of nature world. And you probably have a job that a lot of kids grow up wanting to do. It's a dream job that I didn't know existed until I had it. Basically. Yeah. yeah, and so you write for a Smithsonian magazine as well as the National Geographic, and you've been featured as a recipient of the National Geographic Society. I mean, this is all um, pretty exciting, but as a career path? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's surprising, but I've managed to make a you know an active career just working on the weird animal beat. Yeah, which is uh, wonderful. Yeah, and it is very won wonderful. So, Mallory, let's bring you into the fold. You've got sure. Bob with you. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about about Bob and and what's happening there. So Bob is a corn snake, and he's part of the living collection um, at Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and um, we use him to educate uh, families, children, people of all ages. You know, because I would think that most people, when they think museums, think replicas, not live animals. Right. But that has gone very successful there. Yeah, absolutely. So we find that having the living collection really helps to bridge the gap between our specimens um, and people and make the connections between them that way. That um, probably really helps to reinforce their learning is because they get to handle or see the animals live while they're learning about them, whether in school or at the museum. Absolutely. Studies show that people retain more knowledge about animals when they get to interact with a live animal. 
Yeah. So, uh, Jason, we have some cockroaches that are in front of us, but I understand that you like them. Obviously, you write about these types of things. What I love about cockroaches, and I wrote about this for the Smithsonian, is that you can find them everywhere. There are 5,000 species of cockroaches all across the world. Um, there are really only about 15 species that humans interact with and that we are terrified of. And that represents less than one half percent of all cockroach species on Earth. So we really have no idea, you know, the biodiversity involved with cockroaches. There are some that can glow, there are some that can fly, there are some that actually look like ladybugs. Uh, cockroaches are just beautiful animals. A lot of kids obviously are fascinated by animals and many of them have to write papers and so I would assume they find animals to write about and, and think about the discovery that one has when they get to learn about the differences with uh, animals when they're live versus like Wikipedia or, or online. Yeah I think Wikipedia can actually be a great starting point so um, my recommendation would be to go where the wonder takes you because you know, everybody knows what a cockroach is, but there are a lot of things we don't know about cockroaches that I think if you drill down into those things that are interesting, you'll be able to educate people and yourself in a way that is exciting and not, you know, a boring research you know, yeah. project. So now, so who is this little guy that you are bringing to the set? Sure, so this is Lupe. <laughs> um, Lupe is a coatamundi. She's from South America and she is in the raccoon family. So. Here in North America, we all um, think about raccoons. You probably think about raccoons being around your garbage cans. And honestly, um, Coatamundi is in the same family and kind of takes on the same role throughout Central and South America as well. Um, so they are frequently found around the garbage and whatever else. They are omnivores um, and so, very curious and intelligent animals. Yeah, and Jason, when you see very interesting, exotic animals like this, what is it that, like, what inspires you to write about them? Or what are some of the first things that come to mind that you think readers would want to know? Well, I think first of all, I didn't know Guatemundi existed until only a couple years ago, and I'm somebody that writes about animals for a living. So I think that, you know, there's an amazing amount of diversity that's out there that we, you know, just don't see. There are so many cool animals on Earth that are just waiting to be, you know, talked about and learned about. So I like to focus on animals like Guatemundi that people, you know, are not used to seeing. And, um, you know, the more you care about something, the more likely you are to save it. So you said you revel in the weird and icky. So what is it that kids can learn about uh, being in the weird and icky? Well, I think, um, you know, there's an idea that nature is this beautiful, pristine place. But in reality, it's a really icky, dirty place where you have animals eating each other. You have um, lots of uh, bizarre things happening. And I think that those are great places to, again, you know, sort of get yourself interested in these ecosystems and that the way that they interact with each other. And I think it's okay to focus on things like poop, uh, you know, as a way in. Um, everybody knows pandas, uh, but I wrote a story a couple years ago for Slate about the importance of panda poop. Um, we're learning things about the way that not only their own microbiomes work, but that um, could lead to, you know, medical discoveries based on what we're finding inside of panda poop. Wow, well that's interesting. Panda poop, I will um, be interested <laughs> in reading that. <laughs> so let's see Mallory, who else do you have? I think I know what this is. <laughs> so speaking about weird and icky, this is an animal that usually gets kind of a bad rep. Um, this is a striped skunk and they're found in North America. Um, his name is Pepper Jack. Um, <laughs> we do have his brother at the museum as well, whose name is Gouda. So we named them after stinky cheeses um, <laughs> because you most normally, uh, you know, correlate a skunk with smells. These guys have been descented, um, but skunks are actually really important to have um, in our backyards uh, because one of the things that they eat are ticks and um, they help to cut down on things that could hurt us. So it's really important to learn about animals that might seem icky because they actually all serve a really important purpose. Yeah, yeah, they certainly do. And so what are some of the most important things I think that, that families or parents that are watching can take away about really engaging with animals in, in nature? And so, doing it safely. Yeah, so doing it safely, you do have to remember that when you're going out to engage with animals in nature that you have left your home and you're entering theirs. Um, so it's important to be very respectful and we like to go by the saying that you should take only pictures and leave only footprints um, while making sure to enjoy the surroundings around you that keeps you safe and keeps the animals safe um, and protects their habitats. Um, but in addition, you know, to remember that the love of animals spans far 
longer and wider than just for children, that it's for all ages, and it's something that everybody can enjoy um, making the connection with an animal. Yeah. And Jason, what's your final advice about getting kids excited about learning about animals, but writing about them as well? Well, I think Pepper Jack's a great example that you don't have to go to the Amazon or to Africa to find interesting animals. We have an, an enormous amount of biodiversity you know, in our own backyards and animals like this have fascinating things that even though everyone knows what a skunk is, you might not know that their black and white coloring is you know, sort of a warning sign for nocturnal predators or that you know, the scent that we all associate with skunks is that it's actually a kind of biological chemical warfare. So you know, the more that you learn about all of these animals, even ones that are seemingly common, the more you can get interested in science and nature and biology. And yeah. And conservation as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks yeah, for having us. Yeah, and I'll thanks. thank all of our little pets along the way too. <laughs> <I will. laughs> thanks so much for you watching as well. We hope that our guests have inspired you to take inspiration from nature, and we hope that your family is excited to consume media, and make media that's all about animals. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you again next time for more IQ Smart Parent. Want to learn more about IQ Smart Parent? Visit us online at iqsmartparent.org for more episodes and additional tools and resources. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest to share your thoughts on being a 21st century parent. IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation.